Hello again there folks. Welcome back to my channel. I'm the Lone Adventurer and this is part four of my Ker Nathalis playthrough. If you haven't seen part one there'll be a link up in the corner of the screen right about now and links to all the other parts down in the description below along with a link to Drive Through RPG where you can grab yourself a copy and to my player aids that I have created since a couple of people asked for those. If you enjoy this video do consider subscribing to my channel and liking this video it really does help get the word out there about the channel and is very much appreciated with all that said let's get started so Antonio is doing quite well we uh, went through a couple of rooms in the last video and we've made our way back into the first room since we came upon a dead end there and we're gonna be heading up into the next location so we're just gonna crack on first thing we need to do is check to see if the door is locked there and I think I actually remember how to do this now I think it's a d20 roll and on 12 or more the door is locked 13 interesting so we've got our first locked door there so what do we do about a locked door well, we could try and pick the lock, but we unfortunately don't have any lock picks. At least I don't think I have any lock picks. No, no lock picks. After you have decided to open the lock, whether it's locked or not, you must see... Oh, whether it's locked or not, you must see if it is trapped by rolling a d10. A result of 7 or higher means it is indeed trapped whether it is locked or not. So I've been through a few doors and I've never checked to see whether the door is trapped. So that's something I need to start doing. But on this occasion, we can't open the door. Oh, but we still have to check to see if it's trapped, I guess. Let's see if the door is trapped. Okay, it's not good, because that's an unnecessary complication right now. So if a door is locked and you can't pick the lock, you can always break it down. Well, I'm gonna have to break it down really, aren't I? Because this is our only door. Our only option is to break it down. In order to successfully break the door, you must pass an athletics check. Whether you succeed or not, this makes a lot of noise, triggering a tension die check. Each failed attempt increases successive athletics checks by 20. So my athletics skill is low. It is 20. So we're probably going to be making some tension diet rolls here as we're making noise. So my first attempt at breaking down the door, hit 71, that was seven. 71 means we have failed, we crash into the door, we make a massive amount of noise and we need to roll our D8 to see whether things get more intense. Eight, that is safe. So we're gonna roll again. Uh, what did it say we had on 20 each time? So this time we're trying to roll under 40. And we've succeeded, 26. So we successfully break down the door. We need to do another tension check to see whether this additional noise we created uh, has made our situation worse. Four, that is fine. If we roll a one or a two, then things start to get a bit more dicey. No pun intended. All right, so we're through, we're through the door. Now that we're through into the new room, we need to do the tension die check again for the new room. Eight. And we need to do the lair check to see whether we are closer to finding the lair of the overseer. We are not. Again, a one or a two would have moved us closer. So we're in the room, we've done the checks. We don't have any persistent conditions to check for. So we need to roll for the room shape. 52 gives us, ah, that's nice, isn't it? We've got a little circular room here with four exits. So that's gonna give us lots of doors to play with. So I'll get that drawn on. And actually let's roll for the description of the room as well. 27. The stench of death hangs heavily in this room. Judging by some carvings, 
the Velorians disposed of their enemies in mass graves right here. Lovely. I seem to be saying that for every single room. The descriptions are pretty gloomy and dark, but that just goes with the territory with Black Oath Entertainment and with this game, Kernafarless. Okay, I'll get the room drawn. All right, so here is our next room, room number four. As I was writing a note on my domain sheet, I looked over and saw that the overseer influence for this domain is frenzied, which gives plus two damage to every creature attacking me. Forgot about that. Again, don't know if it would have made a difference, but I'll try and remember it from here on in. Okay, we need to reduce our light source by one. We need to roll for the combat encounter. So we're rolling d20, and 10 plus means we are coming up against an enemy. 18, that's a pretty decisive yes, isn't it? So we have got an enemy in here. Let's find out what that enemy is going to be. So rolling a d20 and a d6. Roll of three on the d6 means we're looking at combat encounters table A. And a roll of six on the d20 gives us a bloodstalker. Bloodstalkers are terrifying predators that prey upon the living to sustain their insatiable thirst for blood. Its pale alabaster skin is accentuated by crimson eyes that glint with a predatory hunger, and its elongated sharp fangs are ever ready to pierce the flesh of its victims. The Bloodstalker moves with eerie grace and preternatural speed, descending upon its prey like a shadow in the night. When provoked, the Bloodstalker can unleash a volley of furious attacks, gaining power from the blood spilled and even healing itself. Well, the Bloodstalker apparently only has one health, which actually makes me a little bit nervous about how this is going to go. It's a humanoid... The weakness is the head, same as me. We've got some armour here, two armour on the chest. Looks like moderately high stats, maybe. We're rolling on the spoils table if we're successful. We've got a trait here. I'm going to have to look that up, penetrating. Let's do that before we go any further. So penetrating. This creature's attacks ignore an amount of armour points equal to the X value. So I don't have much in the way of armour, but I need to remember the Bloodstalker ignores one point of armour. Let's get cracking. We need to roll for initiative, which is our perception versus their awareness. Their awareness is actually pretty high. They've got an awareness of 60. We've got a perception of 50. But we need to remember that because we are a tracker, we have advantage, so we can switch the dice around if we need to. So the Bloodstalker has rolled 72. I have rolled the wrong dice there, but I don't think it matters too much. Have I failed? I think ah, it does matter then. There, yeah, 55. So we've both failed. Now I could try switching the dice around because I have the advantage, but obviously five and a five, if you switch them around, it's still the same. Now 55 is a double, which means that we can mark perception to improve. A couple of people pointed out in between videos skills that I rolled doubles on that I forgot to mark for improvement. So we're now in a position where we could potentially improve our bladed skill, our endurance, our perception and our scavenge. So we both failed. Let's have a quick look see at the rules. Okay, because there is a tie, we both tied at losing, the party with the highest relevant skill score is considered the victor and unfortunately 
Bloodstalker's got 60. I've got 50. So the Bloodstalker gets to go first. Right, so we need to find out what attack just noticed under level adaption, adaptation, which I haven't had to look at yet, is plus one health per level, I think is what that symbol means. So I reckon that means the old Bloodstalker's got two health. So let's see what the Bloodstalker's going to do. Five, Vampiric Drain Physical. The Bloodstalker targets a creature, biting into it and dealing D8 piercing damage. The Bloodstalker gains temporary health equal to half the damage dealt. Sounds bad, but it's a physical attack, so that does mean I can defend against it. Bloodstalk will be rolling combat skill, which is 50. I'll be rolling my bladed weapon skill at 60, plus 10, because it's a defensive roll and I am parrying. So I'm trying to roll less than 70. It is trying to roll less than 50. Looking good. I have rolled 29. And the Bloodstalker has rolled 79. So strong fail from them. And I have passed the test, which means I have successfully defended against the Vampiric Drain. We need to see what defensive move uh, Antonio gets to do. That's a roll on d10 on this table here. Seven. You gain advantage on your next attack. That is handy. Right, so we're moving into the player turn. We will be rolling at plus 10 because the attacking character rolls at plus 10. Still not sure if I should be doing that for the enemy as well. Maybe I should be. So we're going to be using our bladed weapon, trying to roll at less than 60. And the Bloodstalker, this is, I'm going to be doing a standard attack. Remember, the other option is the Sap Vitality ability of the Hexmancer. So we are going to try and get the Bloodstalker with our longsword. Here we go. Ooh, hang on, hang on, this might be all right. Bloodstalkers rolled 72, which is a fail above their combat skill. Now I've rolled 94, but because of my defensive move, I can change that into a 49. That's how advantage works. You can flip those dice around, so that has actually saved my butt. 49 is okay. That is a success, and we can um, progress on to rolling for damage. First thing we need to do is work out where we are hitting this creature. So it is a humanoid. Seven means we're hitting it in the abdomen. It's the chest where it's got some armor, so that is okay. It's a standard attack, so we're rolling d6. We are adding on one because our longsword is a slashing weapon which gives us a five. Five does two points of damage, and I think that's the Bloodstalker defeated. So actually, wasn't too scary at all, as long as I got that right. So the Bloodstalker is defeated. We can recover toughness, we don't need to. Check armor integrity, where well, we didn't use our armor. Check for spoils and get 50 XP. So we'll pop the XP on first. That's taking me up to 160. Not sure at what point we level up, but I'm guessing not quite yet. We've moved up to three enemies defeated as we work towards our bladed weapon mastery. And we're checking for spoils. So D6 on the spoils table. One gives us a mundane item. Mundane items table is D100. 45 gives us a law book. I don't know how that helps me. I'm going to have to look up law books. 
Okay, so a law book isn't something that has an in-game effect. It is just literally a book about the world. So rolling a three gives us the Mysteries of Death book. I'm not going to read this out to you. If you want, you can pause and probably make out the text. So there you go. We've got ourselves a law book. So with the combat out of the way, we just need to do our scavenging check. So we do our scavenging check um, with advantage because we are a tracker. And let's do that then. Um, we need that dice. Okay, so my scavenge is 30. And that is a success, 15, fantastic means we can roll on the scavenging table, which is d20. 18. Uh, more cooking supplies. Well, okay. All right. So d4 cooking supplies. Four. And we get plus one cooking supplies after a successful scavenge. So we've got ourselves five cooking supplies. So that's taking me up to... 13 cooking supplies and again like crafting supplies cooking supplies will come into effect when we eventually camp I don't feel the need to camp yet because I haven't lost much in the way of health my light source is still pretty good and until such time things are looking a bit more shaky I don't think there's any real need to camp. So we are going to push on into another room. I think we will go over this way. We need to check to see if the door is locked. There's no persistent conditions on us at the moment for us to check. Check if the door is locked. 16, that's another locked door. That's annoying. Well, we could, I guess we could just go and check to see whether the other doors are locked. So I might, I might do that initially. I'll just mark that door as locked for now. Let's check this door over here. Five, okay, so this door is not locked. Into the new room, we need to do our lair check. For that, we're rolling D12. Two, okay. So that does mean we are getting closer to finding the lair of the Overseer. So next time we roll our lair check, we will be moving to a D10, which means it's more likely that you'll roll the one or the two, and it's more likely that you will come across the lair. Then we need to roll the tension die, which is D8 at the moment. Four, so that is not increasing. So into the new room, let's see what we've got. 72. 72, we've just got a, a room here with one additional exit. So we will draw that in. Let's just roll for a description. 58. This chamber once housed the living quarters of a family of servants. Faint children's drawings can be seen on the walls. All right. I'll get that drawn in. All right, new room drawn in here. We need to reduce our light source by one. Our light source is starting to get to around halfway. So it is gradually running out. We need to roll for combat encounter. Yep, D20 on a, on a 10 plus, we have a combat encounter. 11, so yes, we do. Let's find out what we're facing. Five eighteen gives us table B. 18 gives us a Vorleg. The reptilian form of the Vorleg is sleek and well adapted to its dark and damp habitat. Its scales glistening with an oily sheen that reflects the pale moonlight. 
The Vorleg's beady eyes gleam with intelligence. Its sharp fangs are ever ready to deliver a venomous bite. What is truly dangerous about Vorlegs, though, is their multiple tentacles that cover their back, which they can use to strike with uncanny precision and ensnare its prey in a vice-like grip. The tentacles are lined with barbed hooks and secrete a paralyzing toxin, rendering victims helpless as the creature moves in for the kill. The Vorleg is a master of ambush, its tentacles striking from the shadows and dragging its prey into the darkness. Sounds absolutely horrendous. So there's a few interesting things about this creature. It's got quite a low combat skill, only 30. Uh, all its attacks are physical, no magic attacks, and it's got armour on all all body parts so wherever I hit it I have to consider its armor it's penetrating which means that it can uh, overcome some of my armor but also alert and venomous so I just need to check how those traits affect the play so alert means this creature cannot be surprised in any way this trait supersedes any ability, gear, or effects that may allow PCs to surprise their opponent. Well, I haven't really been trying to surprise things up until now anyway, because I think, as it stands, I have to rely on my stealth score to do that, and my stealth score is 10. And Venomous, when damaged by this creature, you must pass an endurance check or receive the poisoned one condition. Okay, we need to work out who is going first here. So this is my perception, which is 50. Remember, for perception checks, I have advantage, so I can flip the dice if I need to. Against the target's awareness, which is 60. Oh, they've rolled 95. That's fantastic news. And I've rolled 14, so a really strong roll. That means I'm going first. But it also means that, I, that my first attack gets a plus 20 advantage, plus the standard 10 advantage because I am the attacking character. So that means we need to roll under 90 to do our standard attack with our bladed weapon, the longsword. And the Vorleg needs to roll less than 30 in order to defend. And actually, the Vorleg has rolled 18. I have rolled 60. So we have both rolled under our target score. But because my roll is the higher of the two, that means that I have succeeded at hitting the Vorleg. We need to work out first way where we are hitting it. It is a quadruped. Where are we hitting this particular quadruped? 17, the front left front leg. Now the Vorleg has got armor all over its body. Okay, so armor, it just absorbs the incoming damage. So the Vorleg has got armor level of one, so they will absorb one point of incoming damage. That's pretty bad news, really, because that means we need to roll a five just to do one point of damage. So this creature is pretty, uh, pretty tough. Oh, we've done it, which is good news. So we've taken it down by one point of damage, but I'm now thinking that the maximum damage I can do per round is one so it's gonna take ages unless I get a uh, critical strike but I think that's the deal we're just gonna have to deal with that and um, hope for the best I can always run away if things get tricky but it feels like things are okay at the moment gonna move into the Vorleg's turn Vorleg does a venomous bite physical attack the Vorleg lunges forward attempting to sink its sharp fangs into me dealing d6 piercing damage on a hit. 
I'm going to be defending myself. So once again, it's combat skill 30 for the Vorleg. Or maybe it should be at plus 10, because the attacking character always gets plus 10. I'm going to start doing that. If you think I'm wrong, let me know in the comments below, but I'm going to start giving it plus 10, because that seems fair. So 40 is the target for the Vorleg. And 60 plus 10 for parrying, so 70 is the target for me. I've rolled 78. That's a fail. The Vorleg has rolled 77. Well, that is close, isn't it? So on a fail, I think it comes down to which participant has the highest base score. I think it does. And that's me, isn't it? Because the Vorleg's combat skill is 30 and my bladed weapon skill is 60. So I think I have successfully defended. I get to do a defensive move, rolling a d10. 10. Your next attack doesn't suffer the usual minus 30 modifier when targeting a specific body part. Brilliant, brilliant news. This means I might get a critical strike. Because I am obviously going to choose to target its head because that is the weak spot. All looking good. I've rolled 18. The Vorleg has rolled 97. So that means I have been successful at hitting it. I specifically targeted the head, which means we get to roll two dice because it was a critical hit. Oh. oh no wait a minute I forgot oh no slashing gives me plus one damage if no armor well it has armor which means it's going to absorb one point of damage from each of these dice the three does one point of damage oh, does it absorb the damage does the armor absorb the damage from both of those dice or just one of those dice I'm not sure bear with me Okay, brilliant. So it says here, armor value is deduced only after all the damage rolls have been tallied up. I don't think that helps me in this situation. Maybe, no, no, maybe it does. Because the three does one point of damage. The four does one point of damage. So two points of damage in total. The, um, what's it called? The Vorleg absorbs one point of damage, which means, I think, we are doing one point of damage. So we have managed to whittle it away a little bit. Still quite a way to go, though. All right, just had a little bit of a break there, but I think, yes, we just did uh, Antonio's go, didn't we? So we need to move on to the enemy turn, see what type of action the Vorleg is taking. Three, ensnaring tentacles. The Vorleg unfurls its tentacles and lashes out at the target, dealing D6 bludgeoning damage on a hit. And there's an additional chance that you might become entangled in the tentacles as well. Okay, so we are rolling their combat skill. Luckily, their combat skill is quite low, but plus 10 because they're the attacking character. So they're rolling um, for a target of 40. We are parrying with our bladed weapon for 70. Ooh, that looks like I have failed and they have failed as well. The Vorleg has failed as well. Since we've both failed, we see who's got the highest uh, value. And once again, that's us. That's pretty good. So that means we have succeeded, I think. I'm pretty sure. I'm just going to double check that since it really is working in my advantage. Yeah, if there's a tie of any kind with both parties failing their checks, for example, the character with the highest relevant skill score is considered the victor. That is me. So we get to do a defensive move. Seven, you gain advantage on your next attack. That's pretty handy. We're gonna do that right now. Here we go. 
I have rolled very low, three, so we're not going to need to use that advantage. That was a nine there. And 79, so we have comfortably uh, won there. Okay, so we need to see whether we're doing any damage. Oh, we're being quite lucky here. Five. That means we would ordinarily be doing two points of damage because of the armour on the creature. We should have rolled, hang on, to see where on the creature we are hitting. I'm going to keep that roll of five there, though, because uh, it was good. Right, so this is a quadruped. Seven hindquarters. Okay, that doesn't mean much of anything. That's fine, so we are doing one point of damage. Would have been two if it wasn't armoured, but it is. Back to the enemy turn. Six paralysing grasp. The Vorlegs tentacles close tighter around a creature it has grappled. The target must succeed on an endurance check. Blah, blah, blah. We'll read that in a minute if we fail this. Oh, so I have rolled pretty... Oh, no, that's them, isn't it? I've rolled pretty well. 83 is a failure for the Vorleg. 34 is a success for me. So I need to roll to see what defensive move I'm doing. Six. Your next attack does plus D10 damage. That is fantastic news. On to our next attack. 59. That is a success. And 5 from them. So because so both of us have succeeded. I have succeeded better. Therefore I am the victor here. And so we're rolling the standard D6 damage plus D10 because of the defensive move that we were able to do. Oh, that's low. That's unfortunate, isn't it? Two. Right, so the two is allowing us to do one point of damage. The three is allowing us to do one point of damage. One is absorbed by the armour. I was really hopeful that we were going to finish the enemy off there. I mean, the positive thing is that it hasn't actually managed to do any damage to us so far. So we're going back to the enemy turn. Is that right? Yes. Um, they're doing the venomous bite. Yet I have succeeded in defending because I rolled 47, which is lower than my bladed weapon plus parrying of 70. They rolled 15, but my one was higher. So I am doing a successful defensive move. My defensive move is uh, one, your next attack receives an additional plus 10, not to be sniffed at, I guess. We're going to do that now. So I have rolled 76. Ooh, that's a fail, isn't it? No, it's not, because I'm getting plus 10 for being the attacking character. Plus 10 for my defensive move, so I'm trying to roll under 80, so I've just squeezed it there. And they rolled 80, which is a fail, so I am successful. I forgot to roll on the last one to see where I'm hitting. Never mind. 12 means I'm hitting them on the four quarters, which uh, doesn't mean much of anything. And how much damage are we doing? 3. Three gives us one point of damage, which is absorbed by the armor, annoyingly. So we've got to carry on. This is turning into a proper epic. They're doing a venomous bite. They've rolled 40. I've rolled 30. Oh, their combat skill is 30. Oh, plus 10 because they're the attacking character, means that they were trying to roll, is it less than 40 or at or less than 40? I can never remember. Yeah, equal to or less than. So that means that both parties have been successful. The Vorleg is more successful, so is doing the venomous bite, lunges forward 
attempting to sink its sharp fangs into Antonio, dealing d6 piercing damage. Six, that is two points of piercing damage. I think piercing means that it ignores armor. We, I didn't roll to see where on the body it's hitting me. I think I should do that because if it gets my armor, then I need to check for armor integrity. So I should technically be doing that 10. That means it has hitted me, hitted me? That means it has hit me on the chest and my armor is on my arms. Okay, so we have received two points of damage. That's gonna come off my toughness, taking my toughness down to 15. Okay, back to me. 25. Ooh, so they've rolled, I think that was on zero, zero. So they rolled four, the Vorlog has rolled four. I've rolled 25, both under our target um, numbers. My number is higher, which means I have hit. Where am I hitting the Vorleg? One means I am hitting it on the right hind leg. Six. That means we are doing two points of damage. Only one point gets through because of the armor, but that's enough to defeat the Vorleg. Wow. That was a tough one. I mean, it didn't do me much damage, but that lasted a while, didn't it? So we are getting 50 XP. I think we'll do a quick check to see at what point we level up, because that's taken us to 210 XP. Oh, I can recover 1d4 toughness. Three, that means I'm recovering all my toughness back up to 17. No armor integrity check, check needed, and we're checking for spoils. We're using the spoils table. Roll of d6. Six. Roll on the precious items table. Goody, goody, goody. That's a d20. Eight gives us a magic item. Cool. Okay, magic items. We need to do some magic item generation. When you first find a magic item, you must roll on the item table to determine what type of item it is. Only after you've spent an attunement crystal to learn about its properties can you proceed to learn more about it using the tables in this section. Roll on the item table to learn which type of item you found. Roll on the item rarity table to learn how many properties it has. Okay, so we can only do the first one, which is roll on the item table, which is a D8. One, weapon. Roll on the random weapon table, 204. Table-tastic. Random weapon table is a D100. So we have got a magic harpoon a magic harpoon but we don't know what its magical qualities are until such time that we can spend an attunement crystal i don't know how you get an attunement crystal i guess i'll find out at some point but i'm going to write down that we've got a magic harpoon Does that need to go under weapons i guess or can I store weapons in my in my gear? I'm not sure. I guess I'll put it in my gear for now. So with that done, our combat is over. So we just need to do our scavenging check. So we're doing a scavenging roll. I have rolled 21. That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, my scavenging score is 30, so that is all good. Then D20 to see what we find. Two. You find nothing of interest. Ugh. But it was a, but it was a successful check. So I think that probably means I do find my one cooking ingredient. I'm gonna have it. Let's keep going, shall we? Should we go into another room? We're gonna keep going this way. Let's find out what room we are getting this time. Well first we need to check the door. 
So rolling d20, 10 means the door is not locked. However, after you've decided to open the door, whether it is locked or not locked, you must see if it is trapped by rolling a d10, 7 or higher, and it is trapped. d10, 2. OK, so it's not trapped. Good, good, good. So we are through the door. Then we need to roll for the lair check. So let's do that before we do the room shape. So lair check. If you remember, we're now rolling d10 instead of d12. Two. That happened quick, didn't it? So that means we're going down to d8 on the lair check. We also need to do the tension die check, which is also d8. Eight. All right, so we've been quite lucky on the tension die. Previous game I played, that went down quite quickly. And then you end up with more nasty effects beginning to uh, make the domain more challenging. But that's all good. That's not happening at the moment. Right, so now we need to find out what room we are going into. 39 gives us this uh, little uh, squiff room with one entrance and one exit. Let's roll for a description. 67. Phantom wails fill the air as the spirits of wronged women lament their tragic fate. All right, I've adjusted the room slightly so that the exit door is uh, going down, just so I can sort of bring the map round into this area here. Reduce the light source by one. And then we're rolling for combat counter. So rolling D20, 10 or more means we have a combat encounter. One, no combat encounter. So we are having an event. So that's a D100 roll to see what happens. Probably something nasty. I'm assuming there are some nice events. 23. 23, you have found a trader. Check page 221 to learn more about them. Do I have any money? I've got 20 coins. That doesn't sound like a lot. But cool, we found a trader. Trader information right at the back. While exploring Kernathalis, your character will sooner or later run into a trader. These strange individuals appear in all shapes and sizes, but they have a few distinct elements in common. Their heads are always completely wrapped in thick bandages, and they communicate only with a series of grunts and moans. It is honestly difficult to tell if they are human, but at least they are never hostile they'll pay 50% of the price of any items you'd like to sell and have some items for sale. Check the items for sale list. Well, I don't think I'm going to be selling anything right now. I could sell my magical harpoon. Can you sell... Because I did see they, they're, they're quite valuable magic items. You aren't guaranteed to find a magic item that you will need or want to use. In those cases, you'll probably prefer to simply get rid of the item by selling it to a trader. Unlike other items, the prices shown here are final and do not receive 50% of the price, but the full amount. A magic item's price depends on its rarity. I think you only know its rarity once you know the magical properties, and I don't. So I don't think I can really sell it yet. Oh, look, so attunement crystals, 50 cents, 50 monies. And you use the attunement crystal to find out what the magical properties of the magical thing are. And then I can sell it for much more money. So the only other thing I've got is a lamp. So my question is, how much can you sell a lamp for? Well, a lamp serves as a light source. So would it be foolish to sell my lights, my spare light source? I think it probably would be, wouldn't it? I think I'm going to have to not do anything here. Hmm, bit underwhelming. I was hoping to do some trading then, but I don't think 
it is a sensible move right now. Shall we leave it there, folks? I think that's a decent run. So we are here. Antonio is here. He's doing all right. He's defeated a few enemies. He's got 210 XP. Let's update the number of enemies. I think I've defeated four enemies now. Let's have a quick look at leveling up to see how much XP you need. In order to level up, you must accrue a total of 1,000 experience points. Oh, every time you open a locked door, regardless of the method, you gain 10 XP. We've been doing it for the combat encounters. That's the only thing I've missed. All right, so how many locked doors have I opened? I'd say one. I don't know, because some of these weren't locked, were they? Actually, wait a minute, I've only been through. There's only one door that I had to barge my way through. Okay, so I'm going to give myself an extra 10 XP anyway. Okay, I think we will leave it there. It's becoming clear to me that probably I'm not going to get to level up in this video series because I can't see myself being able to film and edit down enough footage to get through all of that. So what I might do is I'll film a couple more videos and then I will play a little bit off camera and then I'll bring you back for a couple more when we are close to levelling up. That's probably what I'm going to do. Hope you enjoyed that folks. Hope to see you in the next one. Bye for now.